Hello, everyone. May I extend to you all a very warm welcome to another service of worship from Larbert Baptist Church. As followers of the Lord Jesus Christ, we believe that coming together to worship and to praise his name ought to be the high point of our week. And I trust and I pray and I hope that if that is not your experience, if that's not your view of things just now, well, I pray that one day, very soon, it will be. After all, we are coming together to worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. That's the subject of our first hymn together this morning, a hymn of praise about the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of all kings. God of heaven, we believe Gentle Savior, closest friend Stronghold ever beginning and end All within me falls at your throne Your majesty I lay my own before you now. In all your woes, I don't deserve. I live to serve your majesty. Earth and heaven worship you. Love eternal, faithful and true. Live all the nations, ransom souls. Brought the sinner near to your throne. All within me cries out in praise. Your majesty. I lay my own before you now. In all the rules I don't deserve, I live to serve your majesty. Your majesty, I can but I lay my own before you now. In all your rules, I don't deserve. I live to serve your majesty. I live to serve your majesty. together. Lord God Almighty and yet gracious Heavenly Father, we come into your presence once again in the name of our Saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, in the name of the King of Kings that we've just been remembering in praise. We come to you in days of difficulty, days of the virus and of COVID-19. We come to you, Heavenly Father, with our lives disrupted, and uh, we long for the day in which uh, things can get back to some semblance of normality. So we continue to pray that the virus will be eradicated, that it will disappear literally from the face of the earth, and we would look forward to the day when it no longer um, makes people afraid it makes people ill. The days in which it no longer robs us of our family and friends and loved ones. <clears throat> but Heavenly Father, we have been reminded in these last days of just how frail and fragile we are. We tend to think that we have a great opinion of ourselves. We can do all sorts of wonderful and mighty things. And truly we are gifted in wonderful ways by yourself. 
But Heavenly Father, it only takes a little virus to come along. And we realize that perhaps we are not just as strong or as powerful as we think we are. So we thank you that for all things and in wonderful ways, we can turn to you. Because nothing will derail your plan. Nothing will come as a surprise to you. Uh, Nothing will be able to overwhelm or overpower you. And we thank you that when we put our faith and our hope and our trust in you, we are coming to one who will keep us safe for all of eternity. Spiritually safe in your kingdom, no matter what happens to us in this life or on this earth. So help us, especially at times of worship like this. As we come together, help us to look away from ourselves. Help us to leave our problems and our cares with you. We commit ourselves into your hands in that sense. And as we look away from ourselves, we pray quite simply that we would be lost in wonder, awe, and praise. When we fill our hearts and our minds, when our attention is taken by worshipping and praising you, our God and our Father, help us to come into your presence and to see only the might and the magnificence, the glory, the wonder of yourself, of your works, of your name, of your plan, and Heavenly Father, as we look away from ourselves to you and are joined by many others in doing the same, we pray that we would not be so self-absorbed, that we would indeed esteem others better than ourselves. We would look to help others. We would look to befriend others. We would look to witness to others, all with a view to elevating your name and making sure that you receive all the glory, all the honour that is due unto you. So go before us now, even in this hour of worship, and help us to be blessed as we gather together, as we unite in Christ, as we sing your praises, as we gather around your word, as we listen to that word expounded and explained. Lift us up, Heavenly Father, and help us to have that attention focused on yourself, on your Son, with the aid of the Holy Spirit. Please hear our prayer. Go before us now, we pray, in our Saviour's wonderful and precious name. Amen. Now, for our scripture reading today, I want to read all of uh, Revelation chapter 16. Now, it's uh, not over long, but I think it's a wee bit too long just to read at once. So I've divided the reading into two. I'm going to read uh, verses 1 to 11 just now. Uh, Then we'll break for another hymn, and uh, we'll complete the reading of the chapter uh, just after that. So for the moment, it's Revelation chapter 16, verses 1 to 11. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple saying to the seven angels, Go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God on the earth. So the first went and poured out his bowl upon the earth, and a foul and loathsome sore came upon the men who had the mark of the beast and those who worshipped his image. Then the second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, And it became blood as of a dead man, and every living creature in the sea died. Then the third angel poured out his bowl on the waters and springs of waters, and they became blood. And I heard the angel of the waters saying, You are righteous, O Lord, the one who is and who was and who is to be, because you have judged these things. For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets, and you have given them blood to drink, for it is their just due. And I heard another from the altar saying, Even so, Lord God Almighty, true and righteous are your judgments. 
Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God, who has power over these plagues. And they did not repent and give him glory. Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. They blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and did not repent of their deeds. So reads Revelation chapter 16, verses 1 to 11. Our musicians and singers are now going to lead us in our second hymn, Behold the Lord. Thank you. Revelation 16, this time from verse 12. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up, so that the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs, coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons, performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Behold, I am coming as a thief. Blessed is he who watches and keeps his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew, Armageddon. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne saying, It is done. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake, such a mighty and great earthquake as 
had not occurred since men were on the earth. Now the great city was divided into three parts, and the cities of the nations fell. And great Babylon was remembered before God to give her the cup of the wine of the fierceness of his wrath. Then every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And great hail from heaven fell upon men, each hailstone about the weight of a talent. Men blasphemed God because of the plague of the hail, since that plague was exceedingly great. Amen. We will end our reading there at the end of chapter 16. Amen. Well, as we continue our tour, as it were, through the book of Revelation, we've arrived at the chapter that we've just read together. And uh, hopefully we'll be able to cover this entire chapter in our study today. Uh, Chapter 15 and chapter 16, they go hand in hand. Uh, The topic is the seven bowls of wrath. Uh, Seven bowls filled with the wrath of God. Uh, One bowl has been given to uh, each of seven angels, and they are poised to pour these bowls out upon the earth. Uh, The observation has been made that uh, chapter 15 uh, sets the scene and chapter 16 provides the action. And that's a very neat way of summarizing these two chapters. Uh, As I've said, these seven bowls signify the outpouring of the complete wrath of God uh, where the earth is concerned. All of creation, we're told in Romans, all of creation is already groaning, has been for quite some while, uh, under the weight of all that's going on and all that has yet to happen. And that groaning, if you like, uh, reaches a peak, reaches a a climax. It culminates uh, at the end of this age where we are living in at the moment. Now, I hope you've been with us from the beginning. If not, you can always go back and catch up. Um, But we have already had the seven seals. We've already had the seven trumpets. And God continues to call. He continues to warn uh, the people of the the earth. But there are few listening, even at this late stage. Seals trumpets, now bowls that are being poured out. And in spite of all that's going on, all that's going on in the world, all these signs, all these warnings, we read, for example, we've already read in verse 11 and verse 21, chapter 16, that people are still uh, continually hardening their hearts against the Lord. They're not turning to him in the way in which Uh, they're meant to. Just let me remind you of uh, verse 11. In the midst of all their troubles, uh, what were people doing? They blasphemed the God of heaven. Likewise, uh, further on down at the end of the chapter, verse 21, we read there that in spite of all the difficulties, men were still blaspheming God uh, because of the things that had been poured out upon the earth. So, what does God do then? People aren't listening to him. He is sending all these warnings. They're getting uh, increasingly severe. They're um, continually being poured out upon the earth. They have been, they are, and they will be until the end of the age. So, does God stop warning people? Does he stop uh, what he's doing? Well, no, friends. Graciously, he continues He continues until the very end to call out to people, to warn people, right up until the very last minute. And he calls out louder. He warns more clearly. Again, I've often used the illustration of a a little child uh, running into some sort of danger. And if the parent is watching, they see that child running towards danger and they call out 
to, to try and stop the child from going any further. And when the child doesn't listen, when the child persists in running into or towards danger, what does the parent do? He just doesn't stop calling. He calls out all the louder. Louder and louder, hoping that the child will hear and turn away from danger. Well, that's exactly what God is doing, friends. He is calling out louder and louder and louder to the people of this world to turn away from the eternal danger that they are running towards and come to him. But rather than seeing everybody heed his warnings, their hearts just seem to be hardening more and more against the Lord. Well, the time is running out, friends. And we read here that uh, the order goes out from God himself, from the innermost sanctuary in heaven, as it were. Uh, Verse 1, a loud voice from the temple saying to these seven angels who have now all been given their respective bowls, um, uh, go and pour out the bowls of the wrath of God upon the earth. So here we have, it's uh, not a lengthy account, friends, and I'll try to go through them just as uh, quickly as I can, Uh, but here are the seven bowls and the effects in quick succession. We have the first bowl in verse 2, and this seems to be uh, for those who had the mark of the beast, okay? These are the, these are the people who um, have turned away from Christ. Uh, these are people whose mind, whose actions uh, are marked are, uh, by the, the way in which they follow and they think and they, they act uh, according to the instructions of Satan himself. So these people don't belong to Christ. They're not Christians. They're, they're not believers. Uh, they are following the beast. They have the mark of the beast upon them. And this first bowl seems to be poured out upon them. And it, 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 it just describes even more pain, friends. Um, more pain, more unrest, more suffering, more difficulties because they don't turn to Christ. Um, near the end, as these bowls of wrath get poured out and as their effect becomes increasingly difficult upon the earth um, there's a short period near the very end of this age there'll be a short period of intense activity uh, from satan himself And, and satan will have his success in many ways friends oh not the complete and the ultimate victory but he will win a lot of battles in a war that he's going to lose And near the end, God's restraining hand, well, it's being lifted, friends. You know, God is restraining evil in more ways than we can imagine. And we'll know the difference when his restraining hand is brought back and Satan becomes extremely active. We'll see that in the next few chapters as we reach the uh, crescendo of this book. Now, this is an extremely difficult time for the world, okay? Uh, As you would expect, the wrath, the complete wrath of God is being poured out in this terrible way. So, uh, the second bowl is in verse 3. The second angel poured out his bowl on the sea, and it became blood as of a dead man, and every living creature in the sea died. Now, I've been telling you all along and uh, continue to say that this is a book of uh, signs and symbols. Uh, There's not a lot here that we have to take literally. So we can't now all of a sudden uh, switch to a literal way of thinking. We can't read this, for example, and say uh, all of a sudden, after all I've been saying, uh, we can't say that this is the literal sea and it's going to go and be literally turned into blood. Um, and that every living creature in the sea will die. Well, if it's not literal, how do we take this? 
Well, again, friends, um, hopefully you've been following the studies, and we know that the sea, which here is a, a scene of death, a scene of pollution, if you like, and uh, also the blood, the red uh, blood sing- symbolizes violence or death. Um, but the sea here is the international scene. That's the way it is throughout the book of Revelation. Commerce was done uh, largely on the sea in these days. Uh, Great ships and trading routes and so forth. So it speaks about internationalism, about business. And friends, this just falls apart. It's polluted, it's it's poisoned, uh, it's ruined. Uh, So one of the signs of the wrath of God being poured out is that internationalism, And we talk and we hear an awful lot today, friends, about globalization and the global village and how the world's becoming a small place and we're all getting closer and closer together, uh, more cooperative, et cetera, et cetera. Friends, that's going to finish. Internationalism in, in all its forms is going to be destroyed with disastrous consequences. The second bowl being poured out. Moving quickly on, the third bowl is verse 4. The third angel poured out his bowl on the rivers and the springs of water, and they became blood. Okay, well, we've had the international scene, the sea. Uh, It turns to blood and is destroyed. Well, the same happens internally. Uh, These are rivers. These are uh, waterways. These are springs. These are things which are internal to any country. Uh, So all the business, all the commercialism, all the things that are needed uh, to supply and keep uh, individual countries um, going well, uh, that's destroyed as well. Infrastructure. Uh, We're told here that likewise they will be polluted. They will um, become blood. They, They will be lifeless, useless. They're not going to work. The foundation, the stability of countries themselves will disappear. And that, to me, speaks of anarchy. It speaks of lawlessness. Now, we can see it in many parts of the world already. We can see it, perhaps, in the not-too-distant future, spreading to uh, uh, countries like our own as well. The fourth bowl is poured out. We've got to go down to verses 8 and 9 for that. Um, the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun. The power was given to him to scorch men with fire. Now, I'll be honest, friends. I don't want to be too dogmatic here. I can't be too dogmatic because it's figurative language. Uh, so I can't tell you exactly what this means. But I can tell you that it's not going to be good. Being scorched is a horrible, is a terrible thing. It's a terrible affliction to have or to have done to you. Um, And and whatever it is, it's an extreme, it's an intensifying of our problems. Things continue to get worse and worse. And yet there's still no repentance. There's still no turning to God. Uh, Verse 9, the men were scorched with great heat. They blasphemed the name of the God. They didn't call out to God. They said uh, they blasphemed the name of God who has the power over all that was happening to them, these plagues, and they did not repent and give him the glory. There's the problem, friends. They did not repent nor give him the glory. The fifth angel pours out his bowl in verse 10, and he pours his bowl on the throne of the beast. And his kingdom became full of darkness. And they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. Still didn't turn to God. They blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pain and their sores. And they did not repent of their deeds. Now friends, here's uh, the fifth bowl being poured out on the throne of the beast. Now again, we know who the beast is. It's Satan. And, and we read here that this brings darkness Well, we know, we've already reminded ourselves, that this world is, um, it's well, it's the kingdom of Satan. He is the prince of the power of the air. 
So when this bowl is poured out on his throne, on his earth, as it were, where we are now, what does that produce? It produces darkness. Friends, deep, deep spiritual darkness. That's where the world is already. Because we're in Satan's kingdom, because so many people have the mark of the beast upon them, we're in spiritual darkness. And the loss of spiritual wisdom in this world is astounding. God is cast aside. The light of the world is cast aside. And there's still a great refusal to believe. The sixth beast, verse 12, the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up, so the way of the kings from the east might be prepared. Now again, friends, uh, this takes a wee bit of thinking. Uh, And this, by the way, verse 16 here, uh, they gathered them together in the place in Hebrew which is called Armageddon. So this sixth bowl that has been poured out uh, uh, is linked to this great battle of Armageddon. Now that's a topic in itself, friends. I hope in our next study, God willing, that we'll devote the entire study to looking at what uh, Armageddon exactly consists of, okay? But just for now, help us to understand uh, that uh, the sixth bowl that's being poured out is connected with this great intense battle. But but what's described here? What's meaning? What's what's meant uh, by this here? The river Euphrates uh, drying up. Well, friends, we we know where the river Euphrates is. It's still there today, um, and it's over beside uh, in, in in Iraq. It's over beside Babylon. Okay, uh, Babylon. The ruins of Babylon are still there. Um, and the, the Euphrates, when Babylon was a great power, the, the, the great river Euphrates, a mighty river, was just a great barrier, a defensive barrier. If you were coming to attack Babylon from a particular direction, well, you had to negotiate the river Euphrates. It was a barrier, especially in the the ancient world, friends. How could you get all your army? How could you get all your equipment, all the supplies? How can you get all that across the river Euphrates to attack Babylon? It was a defensive barrier. Well, here we read that in the figurative sense, uh, that defensive barrier is gone. Now, uh, traditionally... Israel or Jerusalem's enemies, they all came from the east. Babylon, Persia, it was an invasion from the east upon God's people. Well, friends, when the river Euphrates dries up, there's no barrier. These armies from the east can just sweep across and attack um, God's people. Well, I believe that's what's being talked about here, friends. Um, The traditional enemies of the church, the traditional enemies of God's people, well, our defensive barriers are down. They're able just to to walk across that dry riverbed, as it were, and um, our our defenses are gone. um, They've been taken away. We've been left wide open to attack from our traditional and our ongoing enemies. Friends, God's restraining hand has been lifted. And this describes to me our defenses are down. We are left wide open to a great satanic attack. It's Satan's little season that we've been talking about. The series, uh, the, the, the little season of intense activity at the very end of the age. The power, the genius of Satan unleashed against God's people. God's helping hand, restraining hand has been removed from them. And we're wide open to attack, friends. There's a perfect trinity of evil here, friends. If you look at verse 13, I saw three unclean spirits 
Um, and we're talking here about the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. We talk about the Trinity where God is concerned, a holy Trinity. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Friends, here's the, here's the equivalent in the evil realm. Here's the Trinity of evil. Uh, we have here the dragon, which is Satan. We have the beast. That's his alliance with the world in all its forms. Uh, we have uh, the dragon, Satan. We have the beast, the alliance that's made in the world. And we have the false prophet. False religion, friends. Everywhere. We have these three uh, unholy alliances. And what are they doing, friends? It's the perfect storm. And it's targeting the church. It's targeting the people of God. There's one last bow. The seventh bow. That's described from verse 17 onwards. The seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air and with a loud voice coming out of the temple of heaven saying, It is done. Now friends, when the last bowl is poured out, that's it. That's the end. The complete, the perfect wrath of God, if I can use that terminology, poured out upon the earth. Now this goes into the air, friends. We all know how effectively dangerous that can be when something is poured out in the air. It affects everywhere. It goes everywhere. It gets into everywhere. Well, friends, quite simply, this last bowl is the end. It affects everything. And that voice that's crying out, it is done, that's coming from the temple of heaven itself. That's God himself, friends. That's the last bowl poured out. And God himself cries out, it is done. What does it remind you of, friends? You know what it reminds me of? It reminds me of what Christ cried from the cross. Going through all that terrible pain and anguish that he had to endure. What did he cry out at the end? He says, it is finished. Completed. The anguish, the agony, the sacrifice, it's, it's all been made. It's all been worth it. It's all been successful, but it's finished. Well, it's the same here, friends. The world's had to go through all this pain, all this anguish, all these terrible things, this difficulty uh, that's been um, going on for so long. And, and when it's finally finished, there's God from heaven saying something similar to what the Lord Jesus Christ said. It is done. And then there's a terrible description that follows, friends. Again, it's not literal, but can you imagine an experience like this? Verse 18, there were noises, thunderings, lightnings. There was a great earthquake, an earthquake that had never, the like of it which had never occurred ever before. Islands fled away. Mountains were not found. And hail fell from heaven upon the earth, each hailstone weighing a talent. Friends, a talent is about a hundred pounds in weight. Now, again, we're not going to see hailstones of that magnitude fall to earth. But can you imagine if we had hailstones, each of them weighing a hundred pounds, can you imagine the devastation, the damage, the death that that would cause? It's the end, friends. And still, in spite of all this, men blasphemed God. They did not turn. Their hearts were still hardened. And that's the way they remained. Friends, just to tie this up very briefly. There's one commentator who has been very helpful, uh, a chap called Richard Brooks, if you want to look him up. 
And he gives a trio of applications for this particular chapter. And I just want to share them with you briefly. His words, not mine, as we conclude. The first application from what we've been reading, the first lesson we've got to take from this for ourselves is quite simply, and I quote, there is no comfort and no ground of confidence or security to be found anywhere in creation. Okay? So if you're not looking to Christ, you're not going to have any success because there's nowhere else you can look. There's no comfort. There's no ground of confidence anywhere else apart from the Lord Jesus Christ. Secondly, there's a repeated emphasis here upon the hardening of the hearts of individual sinners. Friends, these are the people who need Christ. And and rather than having their hearts softened or their minds persuaded, no matter what goes on, they seem to get harder and harder and harder and more hardened against the gospel. And that's what we see here as well. We've got to pray against that. And yet, thirdly, there is massive comfort here, friends. Massive comfort for the saints in what the commentator describes as these hair-raising chapters. Now, that's not a particular description that I would have used or have thought of. But it's a wonderful description, friends. These are hair-raising chapters. And they don't affect us in that way. What's going on? How hardened are we? This should be hair-raising for Christians. But even more so for those outside of Christ. So there's no grounds of comfort or confidence found anywhere in the world. There's a hardening of people's hearts. It's going to get worse and worse towards the end. And people will still be hardened. There'll be a falling away, friends. I'm sorry, I don't see a great revival before the Lord returns. I see the opposite. And yet, and yet, there's massive comfort for the saints. Because God is in control. This is his plan. God is in control. And because we are with him, because we are in Christ, that's where we are safe. And you know, the world can throw all at once at Christians, whether it's viruses or persecution or death or laws that are anti-Christian. It can throw everything it wants at us as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. And friends, nothing, nothing can take away our security that we have in the Lord Jesus Christ. So as the wrath of God is poured out upon the earth, has been, is now, and still will in the future. As that wrath is being poured out on the earth, may affect us, friends, in terrible ways, in difficult ways, physically speaking. But we are secure, spiritually speaking, in Christ forever and forever. We can't lose that. That can't be taken away from us, friends. And that is the most important thing. So as you think upon the bowls and the wrath of God being poured out, just remember that it was Christ who took that wrath upon himself so that you and I could be eternally, spiritually secure. We have a lot to be thankful for, friends. And we've also got a lot to pray for as well.
Amen. We'll end our study just there for the moment. And before we go to communion, we'll remind ourselves of what it's like beneath the cross of Jesus. Thank you. We should have been on that cross, as it were. But because he sacrificed himself, because he took our punishment, we can stand beneath the cross as we gaze on him, remembering all that he has done. And that's what communion is all about, remembering what the Lord Jesus Christ has done. Now, we are trying to observe communion on the second and the fourth Sunday of every month. And if that's slipped your mind, uh, we're going to have a short time of remembrance just now. So if this is the time for you to pause this recording and get yourself some bread and something red to drink, well then, as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, you're very, very welcome to join us as we remember his death in this way. So, assuming you've done that and you've remained with us or have returned to us, I'm going to give thanks, first of all, for the bread that reminds us of the, sh the broken body of the Lord Jesus Christ. I just reminded us in our message that the Lord cried out, it is finished. 
and uh, all his ministry on earth had been successful. He had perhaps hoodwinked the evil one, Satan thinking he was getting rid of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, it wasn't the end of him. It was a new beginning, and a new beginning for all his followers as well. So we'll remind ourselves of the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ, the once and for all sacrifice, the sacrifice that doesn't have to be repeated. It was once, and it was for all his people. He has done the hard work. All he requests, all he requires, is for us to remember. So allow me to give thanks for the bread, and then we will share that together. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we have before us a very plain and simple, yet a very profound and potent reminder of the broken body of the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we take this bread and tear it apart, we realize that that was exactly what happened to the Lord Jesus Christ. That his body was, yes, bruised, broken, battered, torn, so that we did not have to receive the punishment that is due to us. He, as the innocent one, takes our punishment. And we who are guilty have a way in which we can be made free. So accept our thanks for this bread. And as we break it and share it together, may it do its required job in reminding us of the broken body of our Lord and Saviour. Amen. It was the Lord all those years ago who took the bread, who broke it, who explained to his followers that this was his body, it was broken for us, we are to do this in remembrance of him. Let's share together in the breaking of bread. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ, being fully divine and fully human at the same time, not half and half, but uh, being human in that sense, when his body was broken, his blood was shed. His blood was shed freely, shed unto death, shed for the remission of our sins. There was no other way. And we are glad that the Lord Jesus Christ took that upon himself. Such is his love for his people that he willingly laid down his life and shed his blood that he might gain his people and an inheritance with them in glory for all eternity. I give thanks for the cup and then we will also share that together. In his name. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, to a lot of our modern sensibilities, the shedding of blood, the sacrifice of the Lord Jesus Christ, crucifixion itself, is a terrible and abhorrent thing. And we are quite rightly appalled when we think of the details or think of what the Saviour had to go through, not least the shedding of his blood. He cried out beforehand that if there was another way to do this, that, uh, well, could that be the case? But he resigned himself by declaring to his Father that it was his will to be done rather than his own. So accept our thanks 
for the cup that reminds us of the shed blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And may that be a constant reminder until we see our Savior face to face and we will have no more need of a service of remembrance for we shall see him face to face and so we shall ever be with our precious Lord. Amen. Let's share in the cup together. Now, to conclude this short service of communion, I'm going to turn to our musicians and singers once again for our closing hymn, I Will Offer Up My Life. Friends, this is something we sometimes say very glibly. Or we sing these lyrics and perhaps we don't think too closely upon their meaning. But just remember what you're saying. Are you really offering up your life to our glorious God? Think on these things as we praise God together. today around the Word of God and around the table of remembrance as well. It has been my privilege to serve you in this way today. Let's close in prayer. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit, may that be the portion of all of your people from this day forward, and even forevermore. Amen and amen.